Hi, today we conclude the book of James. We'll be reading chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Follow along with me as I read. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for these words as we draw our attention to them today. Holy Spirit, guide us, lead us. Jesus, would you speak to us? May we see your face through your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, in our text today, James asks several questions. And he starts out by asking the question, Is anyone among you suffering? Now here, suffering doesn't really mean physical pain, but it's really burdens caused by misfortune or poor choices. We are still going through a pandemic, and globally, we are all suffering. I've personally suffered through COVID, and I have friends who have suffered through COVID. And we've all concluded this. COVID is real. The pain is real. And we don't want anyone to have to experience this pain if they don't have to. COVID is real, folks. And people are dying. And our whole world has come to a halt because of this virus. Yes, there is news about more vaccines being available to us. But until we get to the point where most of us have been vaccinated, we still have to live under fear. We still have to live under uncertainty. That's physically, in our physical world, we're experiencing. What we don't see is the spiritual realm. And we are also all suffering spiritually as well. Many of us are struggling with our relationships with God. Sometimes we feel like he doesn't hear from us. Sometimes we don't know his will. And so our prayer life is stagnant, almost non-existent. And we're going to see today that prayer is an important part of our spiritual health. And we need to recognize that a lot of our problems aren't just physical, it's spiritual. And we know, and hopefully you've experienced this in your own life, that when you are suffering spiritually, it affects your physical health as well. It affects your emotional health as well. And yet, we try to fix our, our physical health, and we try to fix our emotional health, by seeing doctors, or we try to take care of our bodies, or we try to see counselors. But yet, a lot of times the main cause of our problems is our spiritual health, and we are completely ignoring that. And today, the book of James is drawing our attention and saying, hey, you got to pay attention to your whole body, not just your physical body, but how is your soul? Are you taking care of your soul? I was sharing with somebody this week. Some people harbor resentment in their hearts 
And resentment is cancer to your soul. And yet, we are not taking care of our spiritual health, our soul. And we just harbor resentment. And then we blame God and we blame others for what's happening in our own lives. And so, I want to invite you to read along with me, and let's dig deep into these words, these concluding verses of the book of James. Let me remind you, the book of James was written to Christians who were facing trials, who were, whose lives were very difficult, who were being persecuted for their faith. So these weren't, the, the book wasn't written to Christians who had it easy. It was written to people who were saying, why is it so hard when we are following God? Why is life so difficult? Why is it so challenging when we follow God? Because in our minds, we think if we follow God, God should be opening doors for us. God should be making our lives easier. And what are we to do? How do we live? So that's the purpose of the book of James, and that's who it was written to, suffering Christians. And whether there was, you're suffering now or whether it was for the suffering Christians in the first century, the word of God still applies to us today. So let's look at verse 13. He starts out by asking, is anyone among you suffering? Is anyone among you facing hardship? Is anyone among you living a challenging time or going through a difficult time right now because of perhaps poor choices that you've made? What are we to do? He says here, let him pray. Prayer is the answer. Prayer should be the default mode when we are suffering. And yet, what do we try to do when we're facing difficult times? We try to solve our problems with our minds or with our strength and with our abilities. Or we look to our friends and our neighbors and our colleagues and we ask for help. But here, James is saying, when you're facing challenging times or when you are suffering, pray, go to God with your problems. He should be the first one that we reach out to. But God seems to be the last option for many of us. When we've exhausted all our options and we are in a hopeless situation, then many of us cry out to God. And that's backwards. We need to cry out to God first. And so we need to pray. He then asks, is anyone cheerful? Is anyone happy? Let him sing praise. And I, I, and I love these two questions because all of us, we are either suffering or we are either cheerful. So what is James really talking about here? What James is saying is we need to be in constant communion with God. When we're suffering, we need, to, we need to pray. When we are cheerful, we need to sing praise. And we need to do this in the context of the church. It's not within the context of you alone. So that's what we need to do. So are you in communion with God? What does it mean to be in communion with God? Well, it means we need to have daily dialogues with Him. We need to be listening and we need to be praying and we need to be singing praise. We need to be worshiping God for who he is, the almighty God who set us apart, who made us holy. Just that thought alone should make us cheerful and we should be singing praise and hallelujah to God. Just that alone. And anything else, all the challenges in the world should not matter when you know that the God who created the universe sent his only son to die on the cross so that we may be saved, so that we may be set apart 
and be holy because he is holy. Doesn't that excite you? It should be exciting you folks. And we should be worshiping God for that. So let's be in communion with God. That's what it means to be set apart. We should be different than the world. So in the, even in the midst of a pandemic, we should not only be praying, but we should be singing praise to God. And so that's what it means to be a believer. And we have the ability to do so because the Holy Spirit resides in us and God is leading us. But we need to play our part. And what is that? We need to be in the Word. We need to read God's Word. I know many of us aren't spending time in the Word. And if we're not spending time in the Word, how can we say that we are in communion with God? So let's go back. This season, this Lenten season, is a perfect time to go back and reading the Word of God. And I want to challenge you to do so. And I want to challenge you to pray. And I'm not talking about praying for hours and hours and hours. But we need to always be in com communion with God, just always thinking about Him and always asking God for wisdom in every situation, in every circumstance. And the Word of God will come upon you. I promise you, because the Bible promises you that. And so let's live that way. Let's not follow the patterns of the world. World, We need to follow God and His way. Let's continue on. In verse 14, he continues with the questioning, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, the sick can be looked at in two different ways. One is, physically, are you sick? So if you are sick, what are you to do? Sometimes when you're sick, you, have, you don't even have the strength to pray when you're sick. If you are so sick and you're exhausted, you don't have the, the, the energy to pray to God. And that's why we need the church. And that's why James says here to call upon the elders. The structure of the church, the authority of the church needs to be part of our lives. That's why we need to be part of a community, a covenant community called the church. And we need to call upon the elders to pray over the sick. And it says here, anointing the sick with oil in the name of the Lord. Now notice what's important here. It's not the oil, it's praying in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. It's not about the oil. What is oil? Well, if you read through the Bible, anointing with oil was always a reminder that you were visited by God. God was here. Back then, when they anointed you with oil, that oil, the scent of the oil, the aroma of the oil, it stayed with you for days. And so that's a reminder that you were prayed over in the name of the Lord. And as you are sick, lying in bed, and you smell that oil on you, you are reminded that you've been prayed over. And the God who heals is the one that we need to look towards. And that smell also is a reminder for you to pray as well. And so the whole church, in essence, the elders represent the church. So the, the whole church needs to come behind and pray for those who are sick. And that's why churches share prayer requests. And that's why we share prayer requests when we meet, even online on Sundays. The reason why we share our lives and what's happening in our lives is so that we could pray for one another. And so we need to continue to do that. And so... Knowing this, 
our prayer lives need to be rich, but also we need to go deep in our sharing time. If every Sunday we share, well, life is good, I'm fine, everything's good at home, everything's good at work, when in fact you're not living your life that way, in fact your life is falling apart, then you are lying. And you're not going to experience the power of prayer in your life because you cannot even open up and tell your brothers and sisters in Christ what's really going on in your life. It takes courage to share what's happening in your life. But we need to do so. We need to be vulnerable. And we need to share. And we need to be praying for one another. And when we start praying for one another that way, we're going to experience the power of God in our, not only in our own lives, but in the life of our church. And that is what church is about. And that's what God wants us to experience as a body. And in verse 15, he says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. So earlier, I said the sick can be two different meanings, so I talked about the physical illness, but it's also spiritual sickness. Notice the words that he's using here. He doesn't say the prayer of faith will heal the one who is sick. He says the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. So there's a double meaning here of sick. It's not just physical healing. What good is it to be physically healthy if spiritually you're not saved? It's about being saved. It's about the Lord raising you up. That's really what it's about. That's what's at stake. That's more important than being physically well. Notice it's not the person who is being prayed over, right? It's the prayer of faith. It's so the person who is praying, it's, it's that person's faith, it says here, that saves. There are some churches that teaches that if you're not experiencing healing in your life, it's because you lack faith. And that's not what it says right here. So it's not on the person who is sick. And Jesus often healed people who didn't have faith. And so that's what we need to remember as well. So don't judge. When someone is sick, some of us would say, oh, that person must be sick because he has unconfessed sins in his life. Or the opposite. If someone gets material blessings or if, if they just win a fortune or life seems to be going really well for a person, we often think he must have done something right or she must have done something right and God is really blessing this person. So we equate blessings from God when things are going well and if things aren't going well, we think that God is is, is because, that, because there's sin behind this person. And that's not true at all. So let's not judge the way the world judges. He does say, however, here, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So there seems to be a connection between sin and illness. And taken out of context, we see that, you know, there's, we think that there's a 100% link between sin and illness. And that's not right. Here's, here are two examples of a link between sin and illness. In Luke chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, a man is being brought to Jesus who is sick. And Jesus says, Man, your sins are forgiven. And he does that first before healing the man. And also in John, when uh, once again, Jesus heals somebody. And 
the one who was healed doesn't even know who healed him. And then later on, he runs into Jesus again. And Jesus says in verse 14 of chapter 5, See, you are well. Of course, he healed him. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. So when you just take these verses and you only take these out of context, then you think, okay, if you sin, illness is going to come. If you are sick, you must have unconfessed sins. So therefore, you must make sure that your, sins are, uh, your confessions are current and you will be healed when people pray over you. However, these two are not the only instances in the Bible where healing took place or where misfortune happened. And there is no link with sin. The classic example is Job. God just chose that to happen. And, and so Job experiences hardship and suffering. And it's not necessarily because Job had unconfessed sins. So who knows? Only you know. So if things seem to be a little off, examine your hearts and see if you have sins that you have not confessed. Do you have hidden sins in your life? Then confess and it will be forgiven. And that's what it says here in chapter 15, uh, verse 15. He says, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So if, so if the, the possibility does exist that sin and illness are linked, but if there's a big if, so if your confessions are not current, then ask for forgiveness. And it says here, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, right? We talked about that. So that if is the important part. And because of that, we must confess our sins here to one another, it says in verse 16. The power of sin breaks when you confess. I've personally experienced this. When you have hidden sins in your life, that the power of sin holds you down. But the minute you confess that sin, and that takes courage to do that, but the minute you stand before your brothers and sisters and confess your sin, that power of sin breaks and it no longer has a stronghold on you. That's what James is talking about here. We no longer have to hide because we are in a judgment-free zone. And, and church should be a judgment-free zone. Church should be a safe place where you could confess your sins to one another. And, and we should be experiencing the power of God and His love in our lives, and we should be seeing the power of sin break in the name of Jesus through prayer, through confession. And that's why we have to confess and, it says here, to pray for one another. And we will experience true healing, not just physical healing, but spiritual healing. And then he says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Or another way that this is translated is the effective prayer of a righteous person has great power. Either way you look at it, when prayer is done right, when we have no agenda for personal gain, we're going to experience the power of God in our lives. And isn't that what we want. Isn't that what's lacking in our lives right now? And yet, we have it available to us through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. So let's not miss out on this, folks. Let's experience the power of God in our lives. James gives an example from the Old Testament. Elijah. 
Now, he doesn't say Elijah the prophet. He says, Elijah, who was a man with a nature just like us, he was sinful just like us. He was limited just like us. He has shown weakness just like us. Even though he experienced the power of God, he shrunk back. Just read through 1 Kings and you'll see that, that he is just like us. And yet, when he prayed fervently that it it wouldn't rain, it didn't rain for three years and six months. And when we read stories like this, we think it's just a story. But it is not just a story. It really happened. And just as Elijah was able to pray and God moved through this, right? He, he, we, he, it, not raining for three years and six months, that's the power of God. God showed himself through Elijah's prayer. And when we are aligned with God, then his will will be done. So this is not just for Elijah. We need to pray like this as well. But we don't believe when we read stories like this. We just think it's, just, it's a, it's a made-up story. It is not a made-up story. And that's what we need to get. And that's what we need to understand. And, and that comes from faith. That comes from our relationship with God that I talked about earlier by being in communion with Him. We're going to see that what's recorded in Scripture is true. We have to understand what the Bible is in a totally different way. It's not a storybook. It's a book about God and His power. And it it shows us what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It's a serious, it's a serious responsibility and a serious and an awesome privilege to be called a child of God. And that's who you are if you are in Christ. You are His child. You are beloved. And He is pleased with you because of what Christ has done. And then James abruptly ends his letter with verses 19 and 20. And within the context of healing, you see that his concern is not physical healing, but spiritual healing of people, people being saved. He says, my brothers, and of course it's my brothers and sisters, the church. He's really addressing the church. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And that's what it's about. Save being saved. That's what it's about. And so we all have to be diligent with the work of evangelism, prayer, intercession, bringing back. If you see someone who is wandering, what does it mean to wander? That means they're moving far away from the truth. And it says here, anyone among you. So these aren't strangers. These are people within the church. And we see people in the church who are wandering, and yet we think someone else is going to address that issue. Oh, that's why we have pastors. That's why we have elders. I'm not a good friend with that person, but uh, his friend or her friend will address it. No, if you see something, you have to say something in love. But we have to point people to the truth and allow the Holy Spirit to move in that person so that person is brought back to life. His soul or her soul will be saved from death and the sin will be covered through the power of Jesus and His blood. That's what that means. We've got to point people to Jesus Christ and we have to let the Holy Spirit convict the person so that they may know who Jesus is, so that they may be saved. And we all play a part in this. 
This is not one person's responsibility. This is not my responsibility as a pastor. A pastor. This is not the responsibility of the elders of the church. This is all of our responsibilities. Amen. So let's let's go to God. Let's be bold. Let's pray for one another. Let's be in communion with God. So whether we are sick or whether we are rejoicing, we should always be in communion with God. Let us be that church that God has called us to be, the authentic church, the body of Christ. Father in heaven, we thank you for these words today. Help us to follow you. Help us to trust in you. Help us to be bold in living out your faith here on earth. Lord, whether we are suffering, Lord God, or whether we are experiencing just good things in our lives, may we always be in communion with you through your word, through prayer. Thank you for loving us, for setting us apart. In your name we pray. Amen.